We're on with juror and pianist extraordinaire Arnaldo Cohen. Uh, we just heard a, an incredible performance of the Brahms Haydn, or Handel Variations, a piece which you have performed and recorded magnificently yourself. You are very well informed. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do our research. <laughs> we do our research. Um, we wanted to ask you, how do you choose your recording projects as a pianist who can perform virtually anything you want? I think, I mean, the recording, uh, I always had a little bit of problem with recordings because I always think that uh, when you play, you are in a particular moment of your life. Yes. So, uh, at that particular moment, you see the world, you see things, you see a music piece in a particular way. I mean, perhaps five years later on, uh, you see life in a different way. Yes. And, with, and music, for me, represents life. And I normally play and record what I feel at that moment mm. I'm prepared but don't ask me to listen to it five years later <laughs> <laughs> but that actually sort of leads to our next question because it is true recording and performance live performance are very different so how do you navigate the challenges of a recording studio and 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 share your feelings and your your psychology on that work I think I mean the the the, the difference between first of all a professional and amateur is that the amateur plays for him. Yes. Mm. So no matter how good or bad he plays, the important thing is that he enjoys it, right? <laughs> when you play, when you're a professional, you play for other people. So there are so many different aspects when you play for other people. For instance, the pianissimo someone does here is not for him. Mm -hmm. It's for someone who paid the ticket 30 meters away. Right. Otherwise, the guy is going to ask for his money back because he cannot hear. <laughs> so when you record, uh, the public or the ears of the listener basically are the mics, which are one meter and a half away from yes. the piano. Yes. So the projection is totally different. One of the great, I think, um, challenges of, uh, for instance, a live performance with orchestra, which happened to me uh, recording Rachmaninoff concertos, was that, you know, people 30 meters away, they had to, leave, to, to listen to that. But for that sound go there, the microphone was just next. So how do you deal with that problem? So because it would be too strong. Exactly. So there are so many things. And also the, the problem of communication. Mm -hmm. I think the adrenaline, when you are in front of a public, for so many reasons, emotional and so, somehow disappear and yeah when you are on a studio on your own but then the emotional aspect of it it changes mm -hmm. almost saying well this recording you know is going to be definitive <laughs> and a concert is a is a photo instant photo it's right ephemeral. It's evanescent of, yeah. of, 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 of a moment and that should be the recording as well so uh, I know, it's a constant dilemma <laughs> for performers. In other words, you cannot win. <laughs> yes, you can. Do you have any, any recommendations for young musicians who are in the recording studio? We have a lot of musicians, young musicians watching these webcasts. I mean, my, my recommendation is always, uh, first of all, you have to be absolutely convinced mm -hmm. of what you want mm -hmm. from so many different aspects. It's not only feel the music. Again, when I say people who are coming here, a professional, nobody pays a ticket to see anybody suffering. Right. They pay right. for them to suffer. So, <laughs> in a way, uh, you have to pass all these ideas, emotions, and get the intellect, the understanding, the knowing inside out a yes. piece, mm -hmm. uh, and come out with uh, your own vision, but every single phrase has to be thought, but at the same time in a very spontaneous way, in a personal uh, way, which is very hard. So that requires an incredible work. Uh, mm. And this is what my, my advice is, work, work, and work. Yeah, and be, there's no shortcut. And I think the main characteristics of this profession is that there is no limit for perfection. Oh. Yeah, and there's no is. end. You've had such a richly varied career, obviously many performances, recitals, orchestral music, chamber music, but you also curate a lot. You're the artistic director of Portland Piano International. What are elements that you look for in both artists and in programming when you're curating a season? 
Yes, I think, I mean, like teaching or being an artistic director of an of a, of a organization, it's not about my personal taste. Mm. Interesting. You have to recognize one, two. that you have your taste, but people might have all the different tastes, yes. and they are equally important and equally valid. So my only, uh, my always uh, concern would be just to get people who I thought who I respect, uh, as great artists, as great professionals, and most of them different from me. Yes, <laughs> you need to have diversity. Of Eventually, opinions. I would put someone very personal because <laughs> diversity, I think, is the name of the game. What about Absolutely. when you're judging a competition? The same questions. The same. I always try to understand what they're trying to tell me. Mm -hmm. I don't expect them to go there and play what I think they should. Mm. Sure. But of course, uh, the reason why we're there is because supposedly we should know what they're doing. <laughs> uh, we know what is written. Right. Uh, you obviously have well, an opinion. Well, you've done a lot yes. of it before. Yes. I always think the composer way. were more talented than us. Mm. I mean, the composers, you know, that's what is the, the core of the whole thing. We're just mere interpreters Absolutely. of the, the great, this great genius. So I think we have to not be a photocopy of what's written, but I think you have to have a perception, a personal perception of what you think they meant by writing that. Right, yes. and a convincing one. And in a convincing way, yes. and a personal way. Yes. Well, unfortunately, we have to wrap things up quickly, but we have something very special for you. We've been asking everyone um, some short questions, which we're asking them to answer fairly quickly, but this one's different than the rest. Yes, Arnold, Arnaldo Cohen, you are in the hot seat for a special concerto edition of Clive Burning Questions. You have <laughs> such a massive concerto repertoire, so this is very concerto focused. Very That's concerto focused. We're curious on your, uh, which would you prefer if you had to only have one, Brahms one or Brahms two? Brahms one. Prokofiev two or Prokofiev three? Prokofiev two. And same thing with Rachmaninoff, two or three? Three. Which obscure concerto, in your opinion, deserves more listens? <laughs> That's going to be very obscure. <laughs> um, Go ahead. A Brazilian composer called Echel Tavares. Mm. A concerto written in the 30s. Um, it premiered in Chicago Symphony in the 40s, 40, oh. 42, and then was not played for 60 years. Oh my gosh. And uh, it's something and, which... And have you recorded it? I have. Okay, you know, check it out. To that. <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, I have recorded the first, the first appearance of that in a sort of a, uh, a Brazilian label, which I don't think uh, it's uh, on sale. But in any case, we can hunt. Think about YouTube has. Must, yeah. must have. Look at And up. quickly, two more. Um, which concerto do you think is the hardest technically to play? I think I would say Prokofiev II, especially the cadence of the first movement. All right. And how uh, about the hardest musically? Musically. Concerto. 